seeing as my first 50 famous faces of Titanic video is my most popular, and the comments section is chock full of other passengers or crew who were on the Titanic, I decided maybe it's time to do a sequel. This one will be a little different from last time. In the first video, I just listed five categories of the officers, crew, first class, second class, and steerage. And quite noticeably, I did not include many steerage stories. You see, when I was making that list, I realized I was listing so many that I had to slim it down to a solid number, and 50 seemed ideal. Although, in truth, the full number of people covered actually rounded out to 100, because a lot of people were grouped together. But now I'm back to tell more stories about the people who were on the Titanic. Rather than split them up between where they were on the ship, whether crew or passenger, I decided to make three categories. The first being those whose names were requested the most, or mentioned in the comments in the original video, and the second is dedicated to the shortest living survivors, that being from the aftermath of the sinking until the end of World War One. And yes, we will be talking about people who served in World War One. The third category are the names of the people I wanted to include that didn't fit into the first two categories. Albert Edward James Horswell was an able seaman aboard the Titanic. He was born in Essex in 1879, and his parents were originally from Devon. Horswell had two younger siblings and seven older siblings. Aged five, his mother passed away and his father remarried. Aged 11, Horswell recounted how he had run away from home to become a sailor on a windjammer. Aged 17, he joined the Royal Navy and served on several ships until 1902. Horswell had experienced one maritime disaster before the Titanic, when he served on the HMS Royal Sovereign, when one of her six-inch guns exploded. The Royal Sovereign, however, did not sink. Horswell was discharged from the Navy due to hearing loss. He then joined the White Star Line and worked on the Oceanic, and signed on to work on the Titanic on 6th of April 1912. By this time he was living in Southampton. He described the Titanic as the kind of craft that would fill any seafaring man's heart with pride. And he described the voyage as fairly positive, if uneventful, with the passengers being quiet. When the iceberg struck he was in his bunk. His cabin was near the point of impact and he was thrown out of bed. By the time he got there, the engines had stopped, and he noted an eerie silence. He was tasked with preparing the lifeboats for launch. He observed that the Titanic broke in half during the sinking, and he could hear the band playing Nearer My God to Thee. He was ordered to row lifeboat one, the woefully undercapacity boat that contained Sir Cosmo and Lady Duff Gordon. He said that he heard Captain Smith shout, row away as fast as you can. He handed Sir Cosmo an oar and demanded he help with the rowing. Horswell insisted that the boat's occupants never discuss going back for survivors, nor did Sir Cosmo bribe the sailors to stay where they were. Nonetheless, Horswell felt remorse for not helping. In 1913, after leaving the White Star Line, Horswell made his money by talking about his experience in theatres and worked in a warehouse. He married in November of that year, but abandoned his wife a few months later. His experience on the Titanic had clearly traumatised him, and he said he should have gone down with the ship. He managed to reconcile with his wife and had four children. In 1934, Horsball gave an account of his experience via a WGN radio broadcast. He was living in Gary, Indiana at the time. When he retired in 1946, he and his family moved to Humble, Texas, where Horsball would pass away on the 7th of April 1962. He was buried three days later at Rosewood Memorial Park, which was also on the 50th anniversary of the Titanic's departure from Southampton. He requested Nearer My God to Thee to be played at his funeral. He was 83 years old. Major Archibald Butt was born in September 1865 in Augusta, Georgia. His family had a rich military history, with his grandfather and great-grandfather serving in the Revolutionary War, and his uncle was a Confederate general. However, they were not a rich family. His father died when he was 14, so he had to leave school to support his family. He managed to attend the University of the South Tennessee, where his mother worked as a librarian. He became the editor of the university newsletter. After graduating, he moved to Louisville, Kentucky, 
and worked as a reporter on the Louisville Courier Journal, and later on the Macomb Telegraph before he moved to Washington DC. His work made him popular, and he was hired to be secretary to Senator Matt Ransom when he was appointed United States Ambassador to Mexico, where he stayed for two years. Butts initially began military service as a captain in the United States Volunteers in 1900, wanting to honour his family's history. He mostly trusted his own judgement, but he got results. He was inducted into the US Army properly in 1904 as a depot quartermaster. In 1908, President Theodore Roosevelt made him a military aide, recommended by William Taft, who was Secretary of War at the time. But accompanied Roosevelt during his well-known pastimes, such as hiking, climbing, riding and swimming. He also helped organise the White House receptions to make them run more efficiently, but continued in his position when Taft became president in 1909. In 1911, Butt was made a major, but his mental health began to deteriorate in early 1912, brought on partly by being caught in the middle of a feud between Taft and Roosevelt. Taft allowed him a leave of absence and he left for Europe in March of 1912. One place he visited was Rome, where he gave Pope Pius X a letter from Taft thanking him for allowing three Americans to become cardinals, although President Taft himself was a non-Trinitarian. Butt boarded the Titanic at Southampton and stayed in cabin B-38. He was in the first-class smoking room when the ship struck the iceberg. Though there is no official account as to what Butt did during the sinking, it is believed that he acted dutifully and helped with the evacuation, although Walter Lord claims he merely observed the evacuation. Due to his renown in the journalistic field, most of his actions that night are lightly fictionalised. What is known, however, is that he didn't survive the sinking, and his body was not recovered. He was 46 years old. A memorial service was held on the 2nd of May and another on the 5th. Taft took Butt's death personally and openly wept during the eulogy. He observed, If Archie could have selected a time to die, he would have chosen the one God gave him. His life was spent in self-sacrifice, serving others. His forgetfulness of self had become a part of his nature. Everybody who knew him called him Archie. I couldn't prepare anything in advance to say here. I tried, but couldn't. He was too near to me. He was loyal to my predecessor, Mr. Roosevelt, who selected him to be military aid to me. And to me, he had become as a son or a brother, but never married or had children. There is some speculation as to whether he was homosexual, but nonetheless, he was mourned by many upon his death. Edith Rosenbaum Russell was a Jewish journalist from Cincinnati, Ohio, born in 1879. They moved to New York in 1902, where her father worked as a suit manufacturer and invested in real estate. In 1908, Edith moved to Paris to work at Cherit. She expanded into design and journalism, and she would promote Cherit's designs by wearing them for publicity shots. She would write about fashion trends for Women's Wear Daily, telling the New York women how the fashion world worked in Paris. She would also become one of the first celebrity stylists. She was engaged to Ludwig Lowe by 1911, however he was killed in an automobile accident. Edith was in the crash but survived with a head injury. Edith was not meant to be on the Titanic and was instead planning to travel on the 7th of April 1912 on the SS George Washington. However, her editor told her to cover the Paris Rubai races that day. She was travelling to New York to bring purchases from Paris to the Women's Wear Daily office. She boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg and travelled first class in cabin A11. Rather than have her 19 pieces of luggage, much of which contained purchases from her job in the cargo hold, she had them kept in cabin E63. During the stop in Queenstown, she wrote a letter to her secretary, marvelling at the amenities the Titanic offered. The remark that the other passengers were stiff and the aesthetic felt impersonal. She was determined to relax, but felt a strange premonition of trouble, wishing that the voyage were over already. She was undressing for bed when the Titanic struck the iceberg, and she would have seen it pass by her porthole during the collision. In the confusion, she heard the rumour that the ship was damaged and needed to be towed to Halifax. Fearing for her luggage, she asked the steward to oversee her trunks for her. He replied, Kiss your trunks goodbye. However, the steward at least let her retrieve a musical pig, which played the Maxis when one round its tail. She had received the pig from her mother after the car accident. Pigs were seen as good luck in France. Once she had it, she went on deck where Bruce Ismay chastised her for not getting in a boat and he escorted her to Lifeboat 11. She didn't board until someone took her pig and threw it in the boat to encourage her. 
She comforted the many children in the boat with her by playing the pig. Edith lost all her luggage and sued the White Star Line. It was the largest claim out of all the passengers. When she landed in New York, she was interviewed by several newspapers. She wrote a recollection of her experience called I Survived the Titanic, which was published a year after the sinking. Throughout the rest of her life, Edith was interviewed several times regarding her experience on the ship and was photographed and filmed with her pig. She would even be reunited with one of the children she comforted in Lifeboat 11. Edith never married and became more and more reclusive as she got older, living in hotels and refusing employees' entrance to clean her room. She would say, I survived the Titanic, but I never really escaped it. She passed away, aged 95, on the 4th of April 1975 in London. She was cremated at Golders Green. Her pig can be found at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, along with her slippers that she wore that night. In 2005, HarperCollins published a children's book about Edith Lucky Pig. In 2001, James Cameron came across the remains of Edith's cabin on the wreckage. The dressing table and the mirror were still intact. Emil Torsig was another Jewish first-class passenger born in 1857. His family emigrated to New York in 1866. Torsig became a store clerk before working his way up to being president of the West Disinfecting Company. He married Tilly Meandelbaum in 1893 and had a daughter named Ruth. His family travelled to Vienna in 1912 before boarding the Titanic in Southampton, staying in cabin E67, while Ruth stayed in E68. They were in their cabin during the collision and a German steward, Albert Theisinger, told them to put on their life belts and go on deck. Ruth was one of the first to board lifeboat eight, followed by four stewards and 14 women. Tilly begged for her husband to be let on before she was handled into the boat against her will. She banged her head in the struggle. When the boat was lowered, there were few who could row, so Tilly reluctantly helped. Ruth's furs were taken from her by a sailor, saying she wouldn't need them. She wouldn't see them again. Emile died in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 54. Tilly found her husband's shares in the Engelhart Collapsible Lifeboat Company, which she sold for $2,000. She remarried in 1920 to Morris Samuel. They lived in various locations in New York City, while also travelling Europe in the 1920s and 30s. She passed away, aged 84, in 1937, being buried with her second husband's family in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Ruth, meanwhile, married in 1915 to Julius Bernhard Lichtenstein. She had two daughters, Eleanor and Alice. However, Ruth died aged only 31 in 1925 of typhoid fever. She is also buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Eva Hart was travelling with her parents Benjamin and Emily in second class. Benjamin was Emily's second husband with Eva being their only daughter. The Harts were emigrating to Winnipeg when they boarded the Titanic at Southampton. Eva, who was seven, was excited to be on a ship for the first time. Emily asserted that she would not be able to sleep on the ship, anxious that something bad would happen. She believed that lording the Titanic's unsinkable qualities was deliberately testing fate. Eva was asleep when the iceberg struck. The family rushed onto deck, where Eva and Emily were placed into lifeboat 14. Benjamin told her to hold mummy's hand and be a good girl. Benjamin perished in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 47. Eva would recall the experience in a 1993 interview. I saw that ship sink. I never closed my eyes. I didn't sleep at all. I saw it. I heard it. And nobody could possibly forget it. I remember the colours, the sounds, everything. The worst thing I can remember are the screams. It seemed as if, once everybody had gone, drowned, finished, the whole world was standing still. There was nothing, just this deathly, terrible silence in the dark night with the stars overhead. Eva and Emily returned to England not long after, where Emily remarried and died in 1928, aged 48. Eva was 23 at the time and had grown up suffering nightmares of the Titanic. She sought to fix the problem by boarding another ship and staying in her cabin for four days. She would become one of the longest living survivors of the Titanic disaster and often criticised the White Star Line's actions, especially in regards to the lack of lifeboats. 
She also criticised any attempts to salvage artefacts from the wreck when it was discovered in 1985, dubbing it a gravesite, and anyone who took anything would be vultures, pirates and fortune hunters. She was present at the 70th anniversary of the sinking and the Titanic Historical Society, as well as the 75th and 80th anniversary. She published her autobiography in 1994, Shadow of the Titanic, a survivor's story. Her last contribution was on the 15th of April 1995, dedicating a memorial plaque in the National Maritime Museum, along with fellow survivor Edith Brown Hazeman. She died in Chadwell Heath, London, on 14th of February 1996, aged 91. A Weatherspoons pub, the Eva Hart, is named after her. So my necklace broke between uh, takes, so I had to rethink it and put something still a bit more respectable but uh, very simple on. Uh, I didn't really have time to go through all the bloody necklaces. Uh, I didn't really feel like wearing the Heart of the Ocean for a video where we talk about the real people on the Titanic. Plus, this I would not want this near my skin for the next hour and a half that I'm going to be filming this because it is a very cheap nickel ridden necklace that I got off Sheen for £1.50 two years ago just as a prop and yeah I really don't like it anymore. Francis Davis Millet was a painter from Mattapoisset, Massachusetts, born in 1846. His father was a surgeon who served in the Civil War, and Francis also served as a drummer boy in the Union Army. He attended Harvard University and worked at the Boston Courier before becoming an artist. He moved to Belgium and enrolled at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. While travelling around Europe, he reported on the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 to and later published his experiences. Millet married Elizabeth Merrill in 1879 and they had four children. He was friends with several well-known people, including Mark Twain and John Singer Sargent. Many of his works can be found all over the world, including the Tate Gallery and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, among others. Millet was the one who asked President Taft to give Major Archibald Butt a leave of absence for his health. They travelled to Europe together, where he boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg, staying in cabin E38. He sent a letter from Queenstown, where he complained about the passengers' behaviour, particularly the obnoxious, ostentatious American women, and mocked the wives who carried their tiny dogs while leading husbands around like pet lambs. He was last seen helping women and children in the evacuation, but died in the sinking. His body was recovered by the Mackay Bennett and was identified due to his gold watch which bore his initials. He was buried at the St John's Central Cemetery in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. He would be memorialised in the Butt Millet Memorial Fountain and receive a bronze bust at Harvard University's Widener Library. He was 65 years old. Hamad Hassab was an Egyptian passenger serving the Harper family. He was 27 when he boarded the Titanic. He was multilingual, being fluent in French, English and German. He worked as a guide and interpreter at the Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo before entering the Harper's employ. His wife, Fatima, remained in Cairo because she was pregnant at the time. Being a non-white first-class passenger, Hamad was considered mysterious. He spoke little with other passengers. On the night of the 14th of April, he overheard crew members discussing the collision and went to tell the Harpers. Hamad managed to survive the sinking on lifeboat three. When they were rescued by the Carpathia, he sent a brief but reassuring wireless to his brother, telling him he was safe. He went missing until 1915, when he eventually returned to his family. He never told them where he had been or why it had taken him so long to come home. His experience on the Titanic is believed to have caused some memory loss, or he was detained during the inquiries. He refused to travel for another 10 years, terrified of meeting with another disaster. Hamad passed away in 1965. Henry and Maya Harper were returning from a European and Asian tour when they boarded the Titanic. 
Henry, born in 1864, was a Columbia graduate who worked at his father's publishing firm before marrying Maya and travelling the world with her. They had already experienced one shipwreck ten years before the Titanic, which also involved a collision with an iceberg. Myra, born in 1863, brought a Pekingese dog, Sun Yat-sen, with her on the Titanic. It would be one of only a few that survived in the boats. They stayed in cabin D-33, while Hamad Hassab stayed in D-49. They waited in the gymnasium before they were allowed into lifeboat 3. Myra was criticised for bringing her dog with her, but she said there were no objections at the time and there was plenty of room. When the Carpathia arrived, Henry remarked how small it looked compared with the Titanic. The couple were living in Manhattan when Myra passed away in 1923, aged 60. She would be buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Henry remarried and had a son, also named Henry. He resumed working in publishing while spending most of his spare time in university clubs and spent his summers in Maine. He passed away on 1st of March 1944, aged 79, and he was buried with Myra in Woodlawn Cemetery, where they would be joined by Henry's second wife, Anne, in 1976. Herbert Henry Hilliard was an Englishman born in 1867 who had emigrated to America in 1889 with his wife, children, mother and brother. After settling in Boston and later moving to Brighton, Massachusetts, he had three more children. He worked as a buyer for the Jordan Marsh department store. Hilliard travelled to Europe for a business trip in 1912. He and his colleague, Timothy J. McCarthy, boarded the Titanic at Southampton, where they shared cabin E46. He died in the sinking and his body was not recovered, though he was commemorated on his widow's headstone when she passed away in 1924. He was 44 years old. Meanwhile, McCarthy, who had crossed the Atlantic 20 times, also perished in the sinking, but his body was recovered by the Mackay Bennett. He was buried in Cavalry Cemetery in Dorchester, Massachusetts. He was 54 years old. No, please, Ida, get into the boat. No! We've been together for 40 years, and where you go, I go. Don't argue with me, Isidore. You know it does no good. Ida and Isidore Strauss are probably the most famous married couple to have been on the Titanic. And yes, I should have included them in my original list. To this day, I still don't know what happened. They just got cut out somehow. Isidore Strauss, born in 1845, was a German Jewish immigrant traveling to the United States when he was nine years old. His father founded L. Strauss and Company in Georgia, where Isidore worked before the family moved to Columbus. During the Civil War, Isidore worked for a company that aided the Confederate blockade runners. Ida Strauss, Nate Blunn, was also a German Jewish immigrant born in 1849. She and Isidore married in 1871. By then, Isidore was living in New York, working in the Macy's department store, where he would become owner in 1896. Isidore was also a congressman for New York State. Ida and Isidore had seven children, though their second child, Clarence, died in infancy. The couple preferred to travel on German ocean liners, boarding the America in 1912 with their daughter Beatrice on a trip to Europe. Beatrice did not accompany her parents when Ida and Isidore boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg with two servants, John Farthing and Ellen Bird. They stayed in cabins C-55 and C-57. They were not meant to be on the Titanic, but were placed on it because of the coal strike. On the night of the sinking, Ida prepared to board lifeboat 8 with Ellen. However, she turned around and decided not to leave her husband. She is famed for telling Isidore, We have lived together for many years. Where you go, I go. Despite insistence from other passengers, including Colonel Archibald Gracie, they never got into a lifeboat together. Even when offered the possibility of being let on a boat, Isidore said he would not leave before the other men. They were then seen going to occupy a couple of deck chairs. John Farthing perished in the sinking alongside the Strausses, while Ellen Bird survived and lived to be 68, passing away in 1949. Ida was 63. Isidore was 67. Isidore's body was recovered by the Mackay Bennett and buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in New York in a private mausoleum. The mausoleum also acts as a cenotaph for Ida, whose body was not recovered. A memorial service was held for both him and Ida, attended by 40,000 people. One of the eulogies was read by Andrew Carnegie. Strauss Square on Broadway and 107th Street was dedicated in their honour. 
The courage and sacrifice of the Strausses was hailed worldwide in Jewish communities, Ida especially for her loyalty to her husband. Michaela Moulinet Strauss, also known as King Princess, is one of Ida and Isidore's great-great-grandchildren. Another is Wendy Rush, widow of Stockton Rush, who founded Ocean Gate. He is better known as the guy who got himself and four others killed when travelling down to the wreck of the Titanic in a submarine that failed to pass any safety checks. I didn't want to talk about it, but I knew people were going to say something in the comments. John, or Jack Foley, was an Irish Catholic crewman born in 1865. By 1891, he was working as an able seaman and married in 1894 to Mary Murphy, who had seven children. The family moved to Southampton as Foley continued to work as a mariner. He was on the Titanic as early as March 1912, during her delivery from Belfast to Southampton. During the delivery, he was quartermaster, but was tasked with being a storekeeper for the maiden voyage. On the night of the sinking, Foley went to investigate a hissing sound from the forecastle after the collision. He noticed little of significance, though he did tell Chief Officer Wilde about the hissing noise. He briefly went to bed before he was called out again to help with the evacuation. He helped fill lifeboat 4 from A deck, the last boat to release before the crew moved on to the collapsibles. When it reached the water and rowed away, crew members lowered themselves into the water and swam to them. Madeleine Astor begged Foley to let those in the water on the boat. They managed to pull eight people out, although two of them died from the cold. Following the Titanic disaster, Foley continued to work at sea and live in Southampton with his family. He was widowed in 1922 and passed away from a stroke in 1934, aged 69. He was buried in Hollybrook Cemetery in an unmarked grave. Jonathan Shepard was probably the first fatality of the Titanic, not including those who died in her construction. Born in 1880 in Cumberland, Shepard was one of nine children and his father was an architect. In his early 20s, he left home and lived in Lancashire where he worked as a textile machine fitter. He took an engineering apprenticeship before he started working at sea. When he received his Marine Engineer Certificate, he started working for the White Star Line. He was on board the Olympic during the Hawke Collision. Shepard's family were reportedly living in Blackburn, while he himself was living in Southampton by 1912. He signed on to the Titanic on 6th of April as a Junior Assistant Second Engineer, a role he previously held on the Olympic. Shepard was at the point of collision when the Titanic struck the iceberg. During the scramble to prepare the pumps, Shepard slipped into the access plate that was removed, where he broke his leg. Yes, he broke his leg. He was quickly moved to a nearby pump room by Frederick Barrett and fellow engineer Herbert Harvey. At 1.10am, the bulkhead between the boiler rooms 5 and 6 finally gave way. The occupants had seconds to evacuate, and Shepard was unable to flee with them. Herbert Harvey attempted to go back and save him, only to be swept away by the oncoming rush of water. This resulted in both Shepard and Harvey perishing deep within the Titanic, and their bodies would never have been able to be recovered. Shepard was 32 and Harvey was 34. Frank Winold Prentice was the second longest surviving crew member of the Titanic. Born in Norfolk in 1889, he was the second oldest of four children. His parents were estranged by 1911, with his father working as a travelling salesman and living with another woman, and his mother running an apartment house in Kent. Prentice was living in Southampton at this time, working as a ship's storekeeper. He was 23 when he signed on to the Titanic on the 4th of April. Prentice was in his cabin on E-deck during the collision. He didn't realise anything had happened until the ship stopped. He went up on deck to investigate, only to find the well deck covered in ice. He jumped into the sea from the poop deck along with Cyril Ricks and Michael Kieran. The former lost consciousness in the fall. Prentice stayed with him until he died. Kieran disappeared, and Prentice swam to the nearby lifeboat fall where he was pulled on board. While working on the Oceanic in July of that year, the crew discovered an abandoned lifeboat belonging to the Titanic. After serving in the military in World War I, Prentice married Mabel Riley in 1919 and had three children. He was one of the survivors who regularly gave interviews about his experience on the Titanic. In 1982, he appeared in the documentary Titanic, A Question of Murder. This is where the idea of smelling ice appeared, which was a line later given to Frederick Fleet in the James Cameron film. 
Prentice claimed that he could smell ice before the iceberg struck. That same year, on the 19th of May, Prentice passed away in Bournemouth, age 93. He was cremated and his ashes given to his family. Manuel Ramirez Urachurtu was the only Mexican passenger on the Titanic. Born in Hermosillo, Sonora in 1872, Manuel studied law in Mexico City before marrying Gertrudis Carraza y Landero and having seven children with her. He lived a comfortable life in Mexico City until the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Said revolution deposed the dictator Porfiro Diaz Mori and had him exiled to France. Manuel had a strong reputation among those in the political elite of Mori's government. One of his friends, Ramon Corral, was an ally of Mori who followed him into exile. Manuel travelled alone to France to visit Corral in February of 1912. Manuel was not meant to board the Titanic at the end of his visit, but he exchanged his ticket with Corral's son-in-law, Guillermo Obergon. He sent a postcard ahead of him to his mother. Said postcard had a picture of the Titanic on it and he was excited to tell her about the voyage when he got home. He would also send a telegraph to his brother, letting him know that he was boarding the ship. He came aboard at Cherbourg as a first-class passenger. Manuel was allowed to board lifeboat 11 during the evacuation, but he gave up his place when a woman pleaded to be let on and asked her to visit his wife. Lifeboat 11 had upwards of 50 to 60 people on board, so it is likely that Murdoch would not have allowed anyone else to fill the few remaining spaces in case it buckled. Manuel would lose his life in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 39 years old. Melvina Dean is another story who many have criticised me for leaving out of the original list. She is best known as the last Titanic survivor. She was barely over two months old when she and her family boarded the Titanic at Southampton as steerage passengers. The Dean family were emigrating to Kansas, where her father Bertram planned to be a tobacconist. Her mother Eva's parents saw the family off in Southampton. Eva sent a postcard to her family from Queenstown. Milvina, her mother and one-year-old brother Bert were asleep in their cabin on the night of 14th of April when Bertram woke up Eva, saying he felt a crash. He got the family to dress before they all headed to the lifeboats. Eva, who was holding on to Milvina at the time, lost track of Bert when she was put in a lifeboat. She was reunited with her son on the Carpathia. However, her husband did not survive the sinking and his body was never recovered. He was 25. After recovering in hospital, Eva and her children returned to England on the Adriatic. During that voyage, Milvina became a celebrity for surviving the Titanic, where the first and second class passengers took photographs with her, as well as with her mother and brother. The Deans moved in with Eva's parents in Hampshire. It wasn't until she was eight years old that Melvina discovered she was a Titanic survivor. Eva remarried in 1920 and lived happily until her death in 1975, aged 96. Bert befriended fellow survivor George Beeshamp and offered interviews for Titanic-related media before he passed away from pneumonia on the 80th anniversary of the Titanic disaster in 1992, aged 81. Melvina served as a cartographer in World War II and later as a secretary for a Southampton engineering firm. She did not partake in anything to do with Titanic until she was in her 70s. It seemed that the mere mention of it just upset her. She recalled having nightmares about her father's last moments when watching A Night to Remember and refused to watch the James Cameron film, although she was invited to the premiere, as well as that of Ghosts of the Abyss. She was, however, willing to appear at conventions, exhibitions and interviews. She also visited her family's intended destination of Wichita, Kansas, where she met many distant relatives. In 2007, Milvina voiced her disgust at the using the image of the Titanic in the Doctor Who Christmas special Voyage of the Damned. The Titanic was a tragedy which tore so many families apart. I lost my father and he lies on that wreck. I think it is disrespectful to make entertainment of such a tragedy. In 2008, Milvina suffered a broken hip and was forced to sell many of her family's possessions just to pay for private health care as well as nursing home costs. She was unable to attend her final appearance in Southampton because of a broken hip. The Milvina Fund was created in April 2009 to help her with finances. During the campaign, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet donated $20,000 between them, while James Cameron and Celine Dion donated $10,000 each. Milvina Dean passed away aged 97 on the 31st of May 2009, 
following her cremation at St Mary's Cemetery in Southampton. Her ashes were scattered from the docks where the Titanic had initially left port all those years ago. We're joined by someone here. Oh, meet Sash Sash. Come on, say hello. I think he's a bit camera shy. He's new to this whole I sit in front of the camera and talk about things. But he does love attention. You can sit on the green screen if you like. Yes, yeah, sit, sit in perfect range of being swatted by Alan. This must be what it's like when you have children and you work from home a lot. Samuel and Emma Ryzen were among the oldest passengers on the Titanic. They were travelling in steerage, though they may have been wealthier than they appeared. Samuel Ryzen was born in 1842 in Kent, while Emma was born in 1848. Samuel appears on the 1851 census as working as a coal merchant, and then as a carpenter on the 1861 census. His first wife was Mary Louisa Lelliot, and they had four children together. They emigrated to the United States, first living in Michigan and later Texas. Mary is believed to have passed away before 1889, as Samuel then went on to marry his sister-in-law, Emma. They were living together in Limestone, Texas by 1910. Samuel and Emma are believed to have boarded the Titanic at Southampton after an extended stay in South Africa, where Emma's family had links to diamond mines. Though it has been speculated that they were carrying diamonds in their suitcases and were travelling in steerage to avoid suspicion, this has never been factually confirmed. Samuel sent a postcard to his son on the 30th of March 1912 before he boarded the Titanic. We expect to travel on the new ship Titanic, largest in the world, and her trip, 45,000 tonnes. Two more papers, I think, will be all I can send. We shall sail from Southampton on April 10th. That is, if they can get coal enough to go on. It is getting very scarce and dear. Both well, papa. Both Samuel and Emma perished in the sinking, and their bodies were not recovered. Samuel was 69, less than two months from his 70th birthday. Emma was 64. The Ryersons were travelling back to New York following the death of Emily Marie and Arthur Larned's oldest son in a car accident while he was studying at Yale. They were on holiday in Europe at the time. Arthur and Emily were travelling with all but one of their remaining children, Emily Borey, John and Susan. Ellen Ryerson did not accompany them. The family boarded at Cherbourg as first-class passengers and stayed in cabins B57, B63 and B66. And yes, Arthur Ryerson was the guy whose coat Jack Dawson nicked in the 1997 movie. With the Ryersons were the children's governess, Grace Scott Bowen, and Emily Marie's personal maid, Victorine Jaunderson. Victorine was a French immigrant who had been working for the Ryersons since 1910 at the earliest. There was also a distant Canadian relative of the Ryersons on board the Titanic, working as a second-class steward named William. Of all the Ryersons on board the Titanic, the only one to perish in the sinking was Arthur. William managed to survive in Lifeboat 9, where he would go on to serve in World War I and become a sergeant. He passed away in 1949, aged 71, and received a headstone on the 15th of April 2012, recognising his status as a Titanic survivor. Arthur Ryerson and his family, meanwhile, were gathered in Lifeboat 4. John Ryerson, who was 13 at the time, was almost prevented from boarding by Lightoller. Arthur was the only one out of their party to remain behind. His body was not recovered. He was 61 years old. The family returned to New York, where they would likely have had a memorial service for both Arthur and his eldest son, at the same time, if not in quick succession. Not much is known about Emily Marie, only that she remarried in 1927 and died in 1939, aged 76, where she was buried at Lakewood Cemetery. The next eldest child, Susan, attended the University of Chicago and served as a nurse and bacteriologist in World War I. During her service, she met and married Lieutenant George Washington Patterson III. They married in June 1918. After the war, they settled in New Jersey. Their marriage, however, was brief, as Susan died of appendicitis in January 1921, aged 30. She was buried in Lakewood Cemetery. Emily Borey married George Hyde Clark three years after the Titanic sank. They had seven children, but divorced in 1932. She married again to Stephen Beach Cook, Two of her children, George and Susan, were killed in the early 1940s in plane-related fatalities. She passed away in 1960 from a stroke, aged 66, and joined her mother and sister in Lakewood Cemetery. 
John or Jack Ryerson was one of the many survivors who provided testimony for Walter Lord's A Night to Remember. There is a scene in the film where he is shown trying to get on a lifeboat, only to be briefly prevented by Lightoller. Wait a minute! He can't go, it's women and children only. Of course he can go. He's only 13. All right, son, go on. You can look after your mother. Both he and his sister Emily were invited to the set of Barbara Stanwyck's Titanic film. John would be the last survivor of the Ryersons who survived the Titanic. He passed away on the 21st of January 1986, aged 87, and, you guessed it, was buried in Lakewood Cemetery. Meanwhile, Grace Scott Bowen left the Ryerson service and became a renowned teacher in New York State. She would hold parties at New Year's and invite many of her former pupils. She passed away aged 78 from a stroke in early May 1945. By sheer coincidence, she was buried in Lakewood Cemetery. The Widener family were from Philadelphia. George, born in 1861, was heir to a huge fortune. His father, P.A.B. Widener, was on the Fidelity Trust Company of Philadelphia Board. The bank had links to the White Star Line via the IMM. George's wife Eleanor was also born in 1861, and they had one son, Harry, born in 1885. The three of them were staying in Paris before they boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg with George's valet Edward Herbert Keeping and Eleanor's maid Amelie Henriette Geiger, a German immigrant. Keeping himself had served many high-profile people, including a Russian Grand Duke. The Wideners occupied cabins C-80 and C-82. George and Eleanor briefly noticed Captain Smith and Bruce Ismay exchange an ice warning on the 14th of April. The Wideners held a dinner party for the captain that evening at the Alicart restaurant. Afterwards, Eleanor turned in for the night, and George and Harry adjourned to the smoking room, where they stayed until the ship struck the iceberg. Eleanor and Emily were allowed to board lifeboat 4, though the family had spent an hour on deck waiting for a chance to let everyone on a boat. George, Harry and Edwin stayed behind. Harry decided not to try and save his own life, taking his chances by staying on the ship. He is alleged to have been about to climb into a boat, only to remember a book in his cabin and ran back to get it. Harry had been a staunch book lover, collecting many rare editions throughout his time studying at Harvard University. When he boarded the Titanic, he brought a collection of rare books with him, all of which were lost in the sinking. George, Harry and Edwin all perished in the sinking. George was 50, Harry was 27 and Edwin was 33. Only Edwin's body was recovered by the Mackay Bennett, where the locket he'd received from working for a Grand Duke was found on his person. He was buried at sea on the 21st of April. Eleanor provided Edwin's family with a relief trust. She would memorialise her son by establishing a library at Harvard in his name, which held a collection of his rare books. It is believed that she also introduced a requirement for Harvard attendees to pass a swimming test before they graduated, as Harry could not swim and she felt he may have had a better chance of survival if he had. Harry also received a portrait in the University Chapel and a memorial plaque at Hill School. Eleanor remarried in 1915 and travelled throughout her life, while donating to charitable causes. She passed away from an embolism in 1937, aged 75. William Thomas Stead was a journalist from Northumberland. Born in 1849, he began an apprenticeship aged 14 in a counting house in Newcastle. His journalistic career began in 1870, where he wrote articles for the Northern Echo, becoming editor in 1871. He married Emma Wilson in 1873 and had six children. The family moved to London in 1880, where Stead worked on the Pall Mall Gazette, where he would once again become editor when his predecessor, John Morley, became an MP. Under his control, he would turn the paper into a vocal political mouthpiece, urging the government to take charge. It was his fearless determination to expose corruption that led to the age of consent in Britain rising from 13 to 16, as child sexual exploitation was rampant. However, this did not stop him from being arrested and jailed for three months, as he had technically kidnapped Eliza Armstrong in order to prove that child exploitation was just that easy, though he was defended by several religious leaders, including the Salvation Army. Stead's infamy made him the inspiration behind George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, later adapted into the musical My Fair Lady. In the late 19th century, Stead promoted pacifism and founded the paper War Against War, which especially criticised the colonial wars in South Africa, though he always asserted the importance of Britain having a strong navy. 
Almost forebodingly, Stead wrote a fictional article in 1886 where he criticised the idea of ships not carrying enough lifeboats for everyone aboard a vessel. The article in question proposed the idea that if a ship were to collide with another and there weren't enough lifeboats, there would be a huge loss of life. In 1892, one of his papers, Review of Reviews, featured a story about the White Star Liner RMS Majestic, which was still operating at the time, and how it avoided hitting an iceberg. In April 1912, Stead boarded the Titanic at Southampton and stayed in cabin C-87. He was planning to go to Carnegie Hall for a peace conference, invited by President Taft. Stead was last seen in the first-class smoking room reading. He died in the sinking and his body was never found. He was 62. the necklace. To be clear, this segment is made up of a list of untimely ends from the Encyclopedia Titanica website, and I already covered a couple of these names on the previous video, so if you don't see the ones you're expecting to see here, they're probably on the previous list. I calculated the total amount of days in which these people survived before they met their untimely ends which is going from the 15th of April, when the Titanic slipped beneath the waves, rather than when she struck the iceberg on the 14th of April. Oh, and keep in mind, there are quite a few of the um, Syrian Lebanese people who were on the Titanic, and they have Arabic names with many, many accents in them. So if I mispronounce any of the names, I am sorry, I tried to look them up and We'll just see how it goes. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. Maria Nakid was only 13 months old when she and her parents, Saeed Antun Nakid and Wadia Nakid, boarded the Titanic. They were aged 20 and 19, respectively. The young family of Syrian Lebanese descent were planning to emigrate to Waterbury, Connecticut, where Mariam's grandmother was settled. They boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg as steerage passengers. The three of them survived the sinking in what was supposedly one of the final boats to leave the ship. So, most likely collapsible sea, as that was the final boat lowered which Murdoch allowed men into. Saeed is said to have hidden himself under the cover during the rest of the sinking. When they arrived in New York, they were treated at St. Vincent's Hospital and travelled on to their intended destination of Connecticut. Miriam would pass away on the 30th of July 1912, barely 17 months old, of meningitis. She was buried in Cavalry Cemetery in an unmarked grave. She was the first Titanic survivor to die, after only 106 days since the sinking. Saeed and Wadiya had five more children, after Miriam passed away, all of whom had anglicised names. Saeed worked as a labourer and was drafted to serve in World War I. He passed away from tuberculosis in December of 1926. Wadia raised her children alone, following her husband's death. She lived until January 1963, where she died of pneumonia, and joined her eldest daughter and husband at Cavalry Cemetery in Connecticut. Eugenia Albaclini was part of another family of Syrian immigrants. She was three years old at the time of Titanic, her father, Suleiman, had emigrated to America ahead of his family and established a business in Brooklyn, New York, before he sent for his wife, Latifa, and their three daughters. They also travelled with Adal Nahib Kuyama, who was travelling to meet her own father in the United States. They travelled from Syria to Cherbourg, where they boarded the Titanic as steerage. They would have been situated in the aft section away from the single men. The group miraculously managed to make their way to the lifeboats on the night of the sinking, where they were all let into a boat together. They were lucky, as not many large groups in steerage were able to get to the boats, let alone survive together. Adal was believed to have been separated from her companions during the commotion, where she was allegedly helped into a boat by J.J. Astor. Adal would reunite with her father in New York, where she would marry and work as a clothing manufacturer until her death from skin cancer in 1924, aged 27. Eugenia and her family, meanwhile, reunited with Suleiman in New York. However, she would be the second Titanic survivor to die. 
She contracted meningitis and passed away on the 30th of August 1912, 137 days after the sinking. It is likely that the cause of Eugenia and Maria Nikid's illnesses, which led to their deaths, came from the frigid conditions in the North Atlantic on the night of the sinking. Then again, meningitis was a common cause of death for infants prior to creation of a vaccine, and even then, it is still very deadly disease. William Henry Taylor served as a fireman on the Titanic. He was born in Southampton in 1883, where his father worked as a mariner. He married May Calloway in 1907, and they had a daughter named Margaret Alice in 1910. Taylor signed on to the Titanic on 6th of April 1912. He was lucky enough to be off duty during the collision. After being told to get to the boat deck by an unnamed officer, he was ordered into Lifeboat 15, where he would later give his testimony to the US inquiry where he recalled rowing towards the lights on the horizon and his surprise at seeing all the icebergs surrounding him when the sun came up. When he returned home, he started working at the Southampton docks. It was here on the 12th of March, 1914, that Taylor was mortally wounded when he was crushed by a heavy post. He died 10 days later as a result of his injuries, 706 days after the Titanic disaster, aged only 30. Eliza Hocking was a second-class passenger from the Scilly Isles. Born in 1858, by the time she sailed on the Titanic, she had been widowed for five years. After running a boarding house in Penzance, Cornwall, she intended to emigrate to Ohio, where two of her sons lived. They also travelled with two of Eliza's daughters, Ellen and Emily, as well as Eliza's sister, also called Ellen, and Emily's two sons, Sibley and William. When the family left Penzance, the local YMCA choir came to send them off. They intended to travel on the Oceanic, but were moved to the Titanic thanks to the coal strike. However, they almost missed the Titanic's departure when Eliza lost her handbag en route to Southampton. Ellen Wilkes, Eliza's sister, was the only family member to travel steerage. After the collision, Eliza was the one to wake up her family. Their route to the boat deck reportedly included climbing up a rope ladder. Eventually, they wound up in what is believed to be lifeboat 4. Ellen Wilkes survived by getting into lifeboat 16. However, George was the only member of the party who perished in the sinking, aged 23, and his body was not recovered. Eliza's other son, Sidney, met them in New York, where they carried on to Akron, Ohio. Two years later, Eliza was found outside her local hospital with a large head wound and heavy bruising. It was concluded that she had been hit by a car while going to visit Emily. She died on the 15th of April, 1914, aged 54, two years exactly to the day when the Titanic sank. John Anderson was an able seaman from Newcastle, born in 1870. He and his family settled in Southampton sometime before 1880, where John worked as a shipyard labourer. He signed on to the Titanic on 6th of April after serving on the Cape Colonna. It is believed that Anderson survived the sinking in lifeboat 3, but that hasn't been confirmed. After the Titanic disaster, he moved to Cardiff. His trauma appears to have made such an impact that he was committed to the White Church Mental Hospital. He escaped in June 1914 and his body was discovered on the 30th, having drowned in Cardiff's West Dock. There is another claim that he actually survived and remained in the hospital. However, seeing as Encyclopedia Titanica does not have any more information about him after June 1914, it is reasonable to believe that he did indeed drown and this is likely to have been a deliberate act. If so, he died 806 days after the disaster, aged 44. Annie Robinson was a stewardess, born in Bedford in 1865. She appears to have served on several liners before Titanic, though she lied that her age was 40 when she served on the Titanic. In actual fact, she was 47. The choice of her last name is a mystery, as her maiden name was Franklin, and her married name was Grierson Curswell. Annie had already experienced a maritime disaster while aboard the Lake Champion, which also struck an iceberg in 1909, but it did not sink. She was asleep at the time of the collision, though after she dressed and walked towards the mailroom, she saw the clerks carrying mailbags up from the flooding area. 
During the evacuation, Annie assisted several women whom she had been attending to throughout the voyage onto the boat deck. Thomas Andrew saw her without her life belt and insisted she wear one and set an example, as well as for her own sake. She managed to survive the sinking in lifeboat 11. When Annie returned to England, she and the surviving stewardesses were photographed together and she was later shown talking to fellow survivor James Witter. She would give testimony at the British inquiry, but the experience appears to have had such an impact on her that in 1913, when she briefly met King George V, he asked her about her experience, but she was unwilling to answer. Her trauma had clearly escalated afterwards. On the 9th of October 1914, while travelling to Boston on the SS Devonian after 907 days, she was last seen in the main saloon at 10.30pm, looking anxious, owing to the thick fog that the ship had sailed into. Afterwards, she disappeared and was never seen again. She was 49 years old. It was concluded that she had jumped overboard. Robert Douglas Spedden is another particularly tragic story of a child Titanic survivor's life being cut short. Robert was the son of Frederick Oakley Spedden and Margareta Daisy Spedden. They were returning home from a trip to Algiers where they embarked on the Titanic as first class passengers at Cherbourg with Robert's nursemaid Elizabeth Burns and Daisy's maid Helen Wilson. Robert's parents stayed in cabin E34 while Robert stayed with Elizabeth in E40. The iceberg collision awoke Frederick and Daisy. Elizabeth told Robert during the evacuation that they were going on a trip to see the stars. Everyone in their group survived the sinking in lifeboat 3, although Frederick waited to be allowed on after women and children had boarded first. When the sun came up, Robert thought they were in the North Pole because of all the icebergs surrounding them. Frederick and Daisy were recalled to have assisted other survivors on the Carpathia and were gratefully remembered for it. Frederick was also one of a group of survivors including the unsinkable Molly Brown, who thanked Captain Rostron and crew, providing them with a silver cup and medals. Daisy wrote a storybook for Robert about a toy bear who travelled on the Titanic and survived. It was called My Story. The Spedden family were vacationing in Maine in August 1915, when Robert was hit by a car. He would die from his injuries two days later on the 8th of August, 1,210 days after the Titanic sank. He was only nine years old, his parents took him back to New York to bury him. Frederick passed away in 1947 from a heart attack, and Daisy followed three years later. Decades later, Daisy's storybook for Robert was rediscovered and published titled Polar, the Titanic Bear. Frederick William Scott was technically the first Titanic survivor to die serving in World War I. Born in Hampshire in 1884, Scott married Rose Hobbs in 1909 and they were living in Southampton by 1911, where Scott worked for the Royal Navy as a fireman, though he later switched to the merchant service. The previous ship he worked on prior to the Titanic was her sister, the Olympic. There he worked as a greaser. This was a term given to a mechanic or engineer without formal training. Scott was in the turbine room at the time of the collision. This was at the very bottom and the very back of the ship. All he felt was a slight jolt. He received word about orders to stop the ship and watch the watertight doors in his area close. In the commotion, another greaser got trapped in the tunnel where the propeller shafts were. This meant Scott had to open the watertight door by hand. Who this greaser Scott rescued was is unknown as their name wasn't given in Scott's testimony. Scott slid down the falls that previously held lifeboat four. He ended up falling into the water and had to be dragged onto the boat. He would assert that the ship broke in half and the stern section fell and was heaved upright again. He would be called to give testimony at the British inquiry. He continued to work on ships until September 1915. World War One had been underway for over a year by now. Scott was serving on the SS La Marguerite, which was a paddle steamer originally intended to ferry commercial passengers around the British coast. However, it was requisitioned by the Royal Navy to transport troops across the Channel. En route to Southampton, a boiler exploded on the Marguerite. Three of the casualties were found to have died instantly, while another, who was covered in burns, died five hours later. Scott died on the 28th of September 1915, aged 31, 1,231 days after the Titanic disaster. He was buried at Old Common Cemetery in Southampton. Although Frederick Scott was not killed in active combat or by an enemy attacker, 
He was still performing a duty to his country by serving on a naval vessel. This, therefore, makes him the first World War I casualty among Titanic survivors. James Albert Avery was a trimmer from Southampton. He was 20 years old at the time of Titanic and signed on to working on the ship on the 6th of April, his previous vessel being the Oceanic. He was not in the boiler rooms at the time of the collision, but he was expected to take up his shift at midnight. He is believed to have escaped on lifeboat 15. Following the disaster, he continued working on ships until his premature death on 17th of December 1915. Although he was only 24 years old, he suffered a stroke. He survived 1,341 days following the Titanic disaster. His family buried him in Southampton's Old Cemetery, the fourth of his siblings to predecease his parents. <music> Helen Bishop had recently married wealthy widower Dickinson H. Bishop in November 1911. They boarded the Titanic after a long honeymoon in Europe and North Africa. Helen was 19 at the time while Dickinson was 25. They stayed in cabin B49. At the time of the collision, Helen was asleep. Helen noted she felt nothing from the impact and wasn't aware of an emergency until a steward told them to come on the boat deck. They dressed and went on deck, only to be told they had to go back to their cabins. They were summoned once again by fellow passenger Albert Stewart, who had noticed the ship's list of port. Stewart would not survive the sinking. Meanwhile, both Helen and Dickinson survived in Lifeboat 7, where the former was presumably the first one on. Helen had left her dog, Fru Fru, behind, thinking that she wouldn't be allowed to bring her. She would regret her decision. She would help with rowing the boat from the ship with many other women and three crew members. She claimed that a male passenger, Alfred Norney, sat and smoked rather than helped out. That man over there, he's smoking a cigarette. I think it's disgraceful that anyone should smoke at a time like this. Helen and Dickinson gave testimony at the Senate inquiry before they returned home to Michigan. Helen gave birth to a son in December of 1912, but he died soon after birth. In 1913, Helen and Dickinson would be caught in an earthquake in California, followed by a car accident where their vehicle hit a tree. Ominously, Helen had been told by a fortune teller on her honeymoon that she would survive three such disasters, a shipwreck, an earthquake and a traffic collision where the latter would end her life. Her skull was fractured and the impact caused some brain damage, including mood swings and epilepsy. It was partly due to her injuries that she and Dickinson divorced in January 1916. Dickinson remarried in March of that year. Two days later, Helen died from a seizure. This was the 16th of March 1915, 1,431 days following the Titanic sinking. She was only 23 years old. Both her passing and Dickinson's third marriage were shown in the same newspaper. Dickinson himself served in World War I, moved to Illinois and died from a stroke in 1961. <music> Wilfred Cyril Foley served as a steward in steerage. Born in Swansea in 1890, Wilfred moved from Wales to Southampton in 1907, where he began working as a seafarer. He presumably survived the sinking in lifeboat 13. There was a brief case of mistaken identity where he was mixed up with another Wilfred Foley, a steerage passenger, who did not survive the sinking. His family briefly mourned him before they discovered he was alive. Foley moved to Kent after the Titanic sank. In 1915, he joined the army as a private and general labourer. He was discharged four months later, having not met the medical requirements to serve in World War I. This was likely due to early onset tuberculosis, which would plague him until his death three months later. While working at the Royal Arsenal in London, he succumbed to his illness on the 3rd of April 1916, 1,449 days after the Titanic sank, almost seeing its third anniversary. He was 26 years old. George Combs was born in 1881 in Southampton. He married Emma Jane Taylor in 1900 and worked as a stoker aboard ships. They would have six children together. He signed on to the Titanic as a fireman. It isn't known where he was during the collision, nor which boat he survived the sinking in. Had he been asked to give testimony at the inquiries, we might have known something more about him. He returned to sea after the Titanic, though he would begin to suffer from tuberculosis. This was a common ailment that ship's firemen would fall prey to, thanks to long hours exposed to coal dust with little to no ventilation. George Combs would die, aged 38, from his illness on the 13th of August, 1916, 
1,581 days after the sinking. Charlotte Collier was a second class passenger, born in Surrey in 1881. She was working as a cook for Reverend Sidney Sedgwick in Leatherhead. Harvey Collier, her husband, worked at the Reverend's church as a sexton. They married in 1903 and had a daughter, Marjorie, a year later. Charlotte began to suffer from tuberculosis sometime in 1911. The day before we were due to sail, our neighbours made much of us. It seemed as if there must have been hundreds who called to bid us goodbye, and in the afternoon members of the church arranged for a surprise for my husband. They led him to a seat under the old tree in the churchyard, and then some went up into the belfry, and, in his honour, they rang all the chimes that they knew. It took more than an hour, and he was very pleased. Somehow it makes me a little sad. They ran the old chimes as well as the gay ones, and to me it was too much of a farewell ceremony. Charlotte Harvey and Marjorie boarded at Southampton. Harvey had withdrawn their life savings prior to departure, and all they owned, either in the hold or in their cabin, was stowed on the Titanic. Harvey wrote to his parents from Queenstown, where he observed that the interiors didn't feel like a ship at all. The couple appeared to have felt the collision as Harvey went to see what had happened, while Charlotte lay in her bunk with indigestion. In a letter to her mother after the sinking, she notes that she only boarded lifeboat 14 because Marjorie was placed in the boat before her and she felt compelled to follow. Harvey did not join his wife and daughter and he perished in the sinking. His body was never found. He was 31 years old. Charlotte blamed herself for his death, seeing as her ill health made them emigrate. She and Marjorie were put up in a hotel by a brother of a friend, the latter not yet knowing her father was dead. The Colliers had lost all their possessions, save the nightgowns they were wearing and Charlotte's wedding ring. Some children gave Marjorie their toys, but Charlotte feared having to tell her daughter what had happened to Harvey. Though she intended to finish her journey to Idaho, they returned to England after collecting relief money. Charlotte remarried in 1914, but her tuberculosis worsened until her death on the 28th of October 1916, aged 35, 1,688 days after the Titanic sank. Marjorie, now orphaned at age 12, was raised by her paternal uncle Walter on a farm in Surrey. She married in 1927 in the same church her parents had been married in. She would correspond with Walter Lord during the writing of A Night to Remember and passed away in 1965. Archie Jewell was one of the lookout crew. Born in Cornwall in 1888, Jewell started working at sea aged 15 and joined the White Star Line in 1904. Before he travelled on the Titanic, he married Bessie Hurd and the couple lived in Southampton. On the Titanic, there were six crewmen who took up the lookout duty, two of whom I've already discussed. Jewell was on duty between 8 and 10 p.m. on the night of 14th of April and was relieved by Reginald Lee and Frederick Fleet, a hundred minutes before the iceberg collision. Jewell was lucky to have boarded lifeboat 7. All the lookouts would survive the sinking. He would give testimony at the British Inquiry, and he and Bessie had a son in 1916 named Raymond. Jewell continued to serve on ships as World War I began. He managed to survive the sinking of the HMHS Britannic, where he was in one of the lifeboats that was released without authorisation. He jumped from the boat before it was torn to pieces by the rising propellers, but he was still caught in the current. He was saved at the last minute by the lifeboat debris pushing him under the blades. Less than six months later, Jewel was serving as an able seaman on the SS Donegal. This vessel had been requisitioned by the Admiralty and converted into a hospital ship, just like the Britannic. The Donegal was sailing across the English Channel on the 17th of April 1917, transporting wounded soldiers home from France. A German submarine struck the Donegal without warning, even though sinking a hospital ship constituted as a war crime. Archie Jewell was one of the 41 people who died in the sinking, 1,828 days after the Titanic disaster. He was only so far from Southampton, his home and intended destination. His body was not recovered. He was only 28 years old. He is commemorated on the Tower Hill Memorial in London, which honours those who perished at sea in World War I and had no grave on land. He is also remembered in his native Cornwall on the Shoulder Hill Memorial, as well as his son Raymond's headstone. Nellie O'Dwyer was born into an Irish Catholic family in 1889. 
Nellie emigrated to Brooklyn, New York in 1906 and returned home to visit her family in 1912 before returning on the Titanic as a steerage passenger. With her was Patrick Lane, a 16-year-old labourer. Nellie was asleep at the time of the collision, but woke up suddenly when she felt the ship shudder. Nellie and Patrick went out to the third-class deck space and managed to climb to the boat deck. Throughout the experience, she prayed on her rosary. Given how long it may have taken for Nellie and Patrick to reach the boat deck, many of the boats may have already departed by then. Seeing as Patrick dropped to his knees in prayer and started looking for a priest, he may likely have realised that he would not get on a boat in time. Patrick disappeared from Nellie's view, and she never saw him again. He would indeed perish in the sinking, and his body was never recovered. Nellie, meanwhile, managed to survive in lifeboat 10. She recalled hearing explosions and the band playing Nearer My God to Thee. She married Dennis Ryan sometime before 1915 and had two sons, Thomas and Michael. However, while she was pregnant with her third child, she began to suffer complications. This involved preeclampsia which is a condition relating to high blood pressure during pregnancy, coupled with kidney failure. Nellie O'Dwyer would pass away before she could give birth, aged 27, on the 3rd of May 1917, 1,844 days after the Titanic sank. Her sons grew up thinking that their stepmother was their birth mother until they learned the truth years later. She was buried in Holy Cross Cemetery in New York. Edward John Bewley was one of 14 siblings born in Portsmouth in 1885. His father worked as a boatman for HM Customs. Bewley enlisted in the Royal Navy in 1901 where he gained the rank of able seaman and gunner. In early 1912 he had moved back in with his family who were now living in Southampton and worked for the Royal Naval Reserves so he could better help his mother. Bewley would also begin to work for the White Star Line where he was assigned to the Titanic. He was in the cruise mess on the night of 14th of April where he faintly felt the impact from the collision and sensed something was wrong. When he went back out on deck, he could hear the sound of water flooding the ship from the hatchways in the forecastle. He was tasked with helping ready the lifeboats. Murdoch, whom Bewley incorrectly identified as the chief officer, told him to man lifeboat 10. He recalled having to manhandle reluctant women in, which resulted in one unfortunate woman nearly falling through the gap between the boat and the ship. She was saved and pulled back in. Bewley saw that the boat got as far from the ship as possible, in case anyone in the water pulled it down. He would claim that he saw the ship break in half. She went down as far as the after funnel, and then there was a little roar, as though the engines had rushed forward, and she snapped in two, and the bow part went down, and the after part came up, and stayed up five minutes before it went down. Because we could see the after part afloat, and there was no forepart to it. I think she must have parted where the bunkers were. She parted at the last, because the after part of her settled out of the water horizontally, after the other part went down. First of all, you could see her propellers and everything. Her rudder was clear out of the water. You could hear the rush of the machinery. She parted in two, and the after part settled down again, and we thought the after part would float altogether. Bewley joined 5th Officer Lowe in the search for survivors, where he came to realise that the majority of the bodies they searched had frozen to death, rather than drowned. He would testify at both American and British inquiries. On the 21st of August 1914, Bewley returned to naval service less than a month into World War I. On the 12th of December 1917, a little less than a year before the war ended, and 2,067 days after the Titanic disaster, Bewley was on the destroyer HMS Partridge in the North Sea, somewhere between Norway and the Shetlands. There it was torpedoed by a German vessel. Bewley was one of the 97 casualties on board. He was 32 years old and his body was not recovered. His name can be found on the Portsmouth Naval Memorial. Reginald Hardwick was a kitchen porter, basically someone who preps ingredients for the chefs and cleans their equipment. Born in Worksop, Nottinghamshire in 1891, Hardwick was working as a labourer at a local poultry farm as late as 1911, before he signed on to the Titanic on the 6th of April 1912. Not much is known about his experience on the Titanic, only that he survived in a lifeboat and managed to return home, where he worked at the Cresswell Colliery in Derbyshire. He married Elsie Sarah Tyson in 1914 and had two children, one of whom died in infancy. In 1918, Hardwick was training for military service, he may likely have been conscripted, seeing as he hadn't willingly signed up before now. However, before he could see the battlefields, 
He died of an unknown illness after just eight weeks of training on the 4th of March 1918. This was 2,149 days after the Titanic sank. His body was returned to his widow in Derbyshire, where he was buried at St Mary Magdalene Churchyard. He was 26 years old. Anna de Messemaker was born in Belgium in 1875. She married William de Messemaker in early 1912. He had already emigrated to America where he owned a farm in Montana. He was taking Anna home to start their new life together. They boarded the Titanic at Southampton as steerage passengers. They had a vague understanding of the English language that helped them navigate up to the boat deck. Initially, they thought they were saying their goodbyes when William put her in lifeboat 13. As it lowered away, he heard a request for sailors for lifeboat 15, which he immediately answered to and was allowed on board. They reunited on the Carpathia. Anna had suffered from the ordeal of thinking her husband had died, as well as witnessing everything else that night. Due to the intensity of her trauma, Anna was admitted to a mental hospital in Rochester, Minnesota. She passed away aged 42 on the 30th of April 1918, though her cause of death is unknown. Anna had survived 2,206 days since the Titanic sank. William remarried and had four children before he died in 1955. They are buried together in Highland Cemetery in Glasgow, Montana. James McGann was the son of Irish Catholics who had moved to Liverpool before his birth in 1882. James, or Jimmy, worked as a boiler scaler and signed onto the Titanic as a trimmer on the day of her launch from Southampton. It isn't known if he was in the boiler rooms when the collision occurred. He was still on the ship during the final plunge, where he was swept into the sea. Jimmy himself managed to survive on top of the overturned collapsible bee. He suffered frostbite and was hospitalised in New York. He was interviewed by the press where he recalled Captain Smith's heroic last moments, including him holding back tears before abandoning ship and attempting to swim to the nearest lifeboat with a child under his arm. Jimmy continued working at sea and married Catherine McNeil in 1914 and had two children, the second of whom would be born after his death. Jimmy contracted tuberculosis in 1918 and was admitted to a sanatorium in May. Aged 34, he succumbed to his illness on the 23rd. 2,229 days after the Titanic sank. James McGann had a great nephew, Paul, who would become best known to us as the eighth Doctor in Doctor Who, who would only have two on-screen appearances, but became prominent in other media. William Robert Holland Pusey was one of the small handful who occupied Lifeboat One during the sinking. Born in Hampshire in 1890, Pusey married Edith Kate Prince in 1908 in Southampton and had four children with her. He signed on to the Titanic as a fireman. Following the sinking, Pusey defended Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon, who had been accused of bribing the boat's other occupants to not return to the wreck site. The money was in fact offered to replace what the crewmen in Lifeboat One had lost during the sinking. At the start of World War I, Pusey joined the Mercantile Marine Reserve. He was still serving as a fireman as of May 1918. Pusey was on the HMS Dirk on the 28th, 167 days before the end of the war, and 2,234 days after the Titanic sank. The ship, which was off the Yorkshire coast while still on patrol, was torpedoed by a German submarine, the UC-75. Pusey went down with the ship and his body was not recovered. He was 28. His name can be found on the Plymouth Naval Memorial. John Kennedy, born in Limerick, Ireland in 1887, was on his way to New York to join his brother when he boarded the Titanic at Queenstown as a steerage passenger. He carried presents for his relatives with him, including whiskey and clothes. There isn't a record as to how he escaped the sinking ship, but he managed to survive and claim compensation for the gifts he lost. John was drafted into the US military on 26th of May 1918, where he was supposed to undergo training in Richmond County, Georgia. However, not long into said training, Kennedy fell ill and died on the 9th of June, aged 30, 2,246 days after the Titanic sank. His cause of death was found to be anthrax poisoning from a shaving brush. His body was returned to his brother in New York for burial. Daniel Buckley is the only Titanic survivor to have died in the World War I trenches. And even more tragically, 
He was killed in action less than a month before the war ended. Buckley was born in County Cork in Ireland in 1890. He was 12 when his father died. He boarded the Titanic at Queenstown as a steerage passenger, with the intention of meeting his aunt and uncle in New York. As a single man travelling in steerage, his cabin was close to the bow. He heard the noise from the collision and jumped out of bed, where the water was already ankle deep. Though as he tried to rouse his bunkmates, they didn't believe him, and told him to go back to bed. Buckley would not see his cabin mates again. He tried to go back for his life belt, only to stop dead at the sight of the slowly rising water making its way up the staircase. He and another handful of steerage passengers tried to get to the first class section, but were stopped by a crew member who locked the gate in their faces. The passengers responded by kicking the gate down. Buckley, thankfully, managed to get a life belt from a male first class passenger who had one spare. Buckley helped fill the lifeboats and ended up being knocked into another, though its actual number was not clarified. A woman in the boat handed him a shawl to disguise him as male passengers were dragged out of the boat. Buckley also remembered seeing women in the boat become hysterical at the sight of the Carpathia's arrival. He was summoned to testify at the American inquiry into the sinking. He settled down in New York and worked as a bellboy for the Yale Club. In mid-1917, Buckley volunteered to serve in World War I. This was in that gap between the United States declaring war on Germany in April and declaring war on Austria-Hungary in December. He served in the 69th, later 165th New York Infantry, where he began fighting in combat from October of that year. He was one of the few survivors of the Rouge Bouquet campaign. However, during the Argonne campaign on 15th of October 1918, a mere 27 days before the end of the war, 2,374 days since the Titanic sank, and while the Allies and Central Powers had already opened peace talks, Buckley was helping with the evacuation of wounded soldiers from the Meuse-Argonne front when he was shot in the head by an enemy sniper. After the war, his body was returned to Ireland and buried in King Williamstown Cemetery, though that has now been renamed to Bally Desmond Cemetery. His status as a Titanic survivor is on his tombstone. Hannah O'Brien was, surprisingly, the only Titanic survivor to have died as a result of the Spanish flu outbreak. She was born in County Limerick in 1884. Her father, a farmer, died when she was aged 20 and her brother took over the family property. She was married to Thomas O'Brien sometime before 1912 when she was pregnant, although there is no official record of their marriage. They decided to emigrate to Chicago, Illinois. They boarded the Titanic at Queenstown as steerage passengers. Hannah managed to survive the sinking. Thomas was unable to follow his wife and died in the sinking aged 26, and his body was not recovered. Hannah did not continue on to Chicago, but instead stayed in New York and gave birth to a daughter in September. She managed to prove to the compensation office that she was indeed married to her late husband, and claimed the relief fund that she was entitled to even though her sister-in-law was trying to claim the money from her. Hannah settled in Brooklyn and married an Irishman, where they had a son. The Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920, which didn't actually originate in Spain, swept through New York City in three waves and killed roughly 30,000 people. Hannah O'Brien succumbed to the disease in the first wave on 17th of October 1918, 2,376 days after the Titanic disaster. The rest of her family were fortunate to survive through the pandemic, and she was buried in Holy Cross Cemetery. Albert Edward Lane was a first-class saloon steward from Nottingham. Born in 1879, his father was seemingly absent for most of his life and died before the 1891 census, when Albert was 12. His mother made ends meet by working as a laundress and a hosiery machinist. Albert married Florence Cushing in 1899, who worked in Nottingham's famous lace market. They had a daughter, also named Florence, who sadly died in infancy. In 1911, the couple moved to Woolston, Hampshire, where Albert worked as a ship steward. He signed on to the Titanic on 4th of April 1912. He would perish in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 33 years old. April 1912, 14 people from the parish of Adderghoul in the west of Ireland set sail to emigrate to America. They were emigrating from poverty 
to find a better life for themselves. Unfortunately for them, they had the bad luck to step on board the ill-fated steamliner, the Ship of Dreams, the RMS Titanic. The Co Mayo Group, or Adagul 14, were a group of Irish immigrants that were either neighbours or loosely related to each other, all of whom were born in County Mayo and boarded the Titanic at Queenstown together. Of their group, only three would survive the sinking. I will run through their names in alphabetical order. John Burke, aged 42, a farmer married to Catherine McHugh in 1911. Catherine Burke, aged 32 orphaned at 16 and had previously lived in Chicago, Illinois, before returning to Ireland in 1910 and marrying John Burke. She may have been pregnant when they sailed. Mary Burke, aged 40, sister of John Burke and worked as a farmer's servant. Mary Canavan, aged 22. On the same day she boarded the Titanic, her elder brother Patrick was disembarking the Olympic in New York. She intended to meet with him once she reached America. Patrick Canavan, aged 21, cousin to Mary Canavan, he worked as a general labourer and two of his siblings had already emigrated. Bridget Donoghue, aged 21. She came from a large family where she had four siblings and four half-siblings. Honor Fleming, aged 22. She intended to join her sister Catherine in New York. Her birthday was two days before they sailed. James Flynn, aged 28. He intended to join his younger brother Anthony in New York. Anna Catherine Kelly, aged 20. She planned on joining her cousins in Chicago. Bridget Delia Marn, aged 20. She worked as a servant for a physician in Ballyrock. Mary Mangan, aged 32. She worked on a farm before travelling to the United States sometime in 1906. She returned to visit her mother in 1911, having recently become engaged. Her sister Ellen decided to stay in Ireland with their mother. Bridget Delia McDermott, aged 31. She was planning to go to Missouri where her cousin lived. She bought new clothes to start a new life, including a hat. The night before the group left, she was confronted by a man who told her she would survive a great tragedy. Anna Louise McGowan, aged 17, the youngest in the group and niece to Catherine McGowan. She and her family had briefly emigrated to the United States before deciding to return to Ireland. Anna wanted to return to the United States with her aunt. Catherine McGowan, aged 42, the leader of the group and aunt to Anna McGowan. She had emigrated to the United States in 1888 and opened a boarding house in Chicago, Illinois. She came to Ireland in 1911 to take her niece overseas, the rest of the County Mayo group following them. None of the three survivors would claim that they felt the collision with the iceberg on 14th of April. Anna Catherine Kelly recalled that they were not warned in time by the stewards and any steerage passenger who did go on deck to investigate was sent back down, being told there was no danger. The group managed to get to the boat deck by climbing up a ladder. Catherine and Mary Burke refused to leave John behind and remained with him, allowing Anna Catherine Kelly to take their place in lifeboat 16. Anna Louise is believed to have been rescued in lifeboat 13, though she was only wearing her dress and shoes. Meanwhile, Bridget McDermott was about to board a lifeboat when she realised that she'd left her new hat in her cabin. When she came back to the boat deck, she had to climb down a rope ladder into what is believed was lifeboat 13. The rest of the group perished in the sinking. Of the dozen casualties, only Mary Mangan's body was recovered by the Mackay Bennett crew. She was identified by an engraved gold watch and her locket. Her brother Edward attempted to sue the White Star Line. Anna Louise recalled that the ship busted in half as she went down. As the Carpathia arrived in New York, a sailor pointed out to the Statue of Liberty and told her to look back to the sea if she would never return. She swore she would never board another ship for the rest of her life. She was treated in hospital before she went to Chicago, where she met another aunt of hers. After attending business school, she married Albert Straub in 1920 and had three daughters. Though she kept a collection of articles about the Titanic disaster, she rarely talked about her experience, saving it for her grandchildren doing school projects. She was interviewed for a Daily Herald article in 1984, when the wreck was discovered, she criticised the idea of retrieving artefacts from it, wanting the victims to rest in peace. Anna Louise died on 30th of January 1990, aged 95 in Chicago. She was the penultimate Titanic survivor of Irish descent. Anna Catherine Kelly became a nun, Sister Patrick Joseph Kelly, and taught in schools around the Midwest, including Illinois, Iowa and Michigan. She passed away on the 28th of December 1969, aged 77. Finally, Bridget McDermott married John Joseph Lynch and had three children. They lived in New Jersey for the rest of their lives where Bridget ran a boarding house. 
She passed away on the 3rd of November 1959, aged 78, and was buried with three other Titanic survivors in Holy Name Cemetery. Edith and Thomas Pears were a married couple travelling in first class. Thomas was born in 1882 and joined the family business in the A&F Pears Limited Soap Making Company. There he became manager of the Landeron Works in Islesworth, Middlesex. Edith, meanwhile, was a daughter of a businessman, Frank Wern, who helped found what would become the Gonzales Bayer Sherry Making Company. Edith briefly lived in France after leaving school before returning to England, where she would meet Thomas through friends. They were married on 15th of September 1910. They boarded the Titanic at Southampton with the intention of scouting for a location for the Pears Company to expand into America. They stayed in cabin C2. On the 13th of April, they sent a wireless back to Islesworth, saying the voyage was going well. It did not reach its destination until the 15th of April at 1.30pm. Edith managed to survive the sinking in lifeboat 8, while Thomas perished in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 29. Due to the mixed-up information, it was falsely confirmed that both of them had survived. Edith arrived in New York and stayed at the Hotel Woodward with friends of the Pears family, where it was confirmed that Thomas had indeed gone down with the ship. Edith returned home on the 20th of April, where she received an inheritance from her husband of almost £17,000. Two of her brothers died in World War I, while a third suffered mental trauma and was hospitalised for nearly 60 years until his death. Edith did her part for the war effort by being a nurse and an ambulance driver. She was also a driver for naval officers. She remarried to D.V. Crow before 1920 and had two children. Despite being able to find happiness again, Edith's own mental health deteriorated. She ingested ammonia in 1956 and died in hospital on 24th of March, aged 66. Quartermaster Rowe. Can you send and read Moss? Yes, sir. Then signal and keep signalling. We are the Titanic sinking. George Thomas Rowe was one of the seven quartermasters on the Titanic. This was the title given to a petty officer tasked with signals and steering, which, yes, means that Rowe steered the ship herself at least once during the voyage. Rowe was born in Hampshire in 1881. He joined the Royal Navy in 1895. He was discharged in 1910 before he was employed by the White Star Line. He was on the Titanic as early as Belfast and served as a lookout during the delivery trip to Southampton. Rowe was on the poop deck at the time of the collision, where he only just slightly felt the impact. He noted the time was indeed 11.40pm. Moments later, the iceberg passed in front of him, which he described to have been a hundred feet high. He stayed at his post until 12.25am, when he noticed a boat being lowered. He was summoned to the bridge via telephone, where he was tasked with firing distress rockets with 4th Officer Boxhall for at least an hour. Between firing the rockets, he would send a distress code from the bridge lights in Morse. Rowe did not end up firing all the rockets, as Captain Smith asked him to help with loading collapsible sea, which he would then leave the ship in. The boat headed towards lights on the horizon, but changed course towards another lifeboat. After the disaster, Rowe testified at both inquiries. In 1914, he married Frances Reed and had three children. He'd returned to maritime service during World War I, followed by working in Southampton Dock. In 1960, he was granted the British Empire Medal. He was one of the most informative survivors to correspond with Walter Lord, and would give interviews about his experience, including one in 1957 with other survivors. He passed away on the 14th of February 1974, aged 92, where he was buried in Holy Saviour Churchyard. Maggie. Ma, I'm gonna brain you if you don't stop calling me Maggie. Sit up straight. Was I slouching? I'm not concerned with your posture, honey. You're blocking my view. Emma Bucknell was the daughter of a Baptist missionary and was born in India in 1852. After their return, Emma's mother died in 1868 and her father remarried. Emma herself married William Robert Bucknell in 1871. He was a real estate dealer as well as a builder of gas and waterworks and he owned a large number of coal and iron mines. Such was his influence that the University of Lewisburg was renamed to Bucknell University. She was 19 and he was 60. She would have four children with him, on top of five stepchildren from her husband's first marriage. They lived in Philadelphia until his death in 1890. Emma spent her widowed life traveling and living between Philadelphia and her summer home, Pine Point Lodge in New York State. Her daughter had married a European count 
and Emma had come to visit them in late 1911. She boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg as a first-class passenger, staying in cabin D15. She had a strange foreboding about the ship before boarding, which she confided to Margaret Brown. Emma survived the sinking in lifeboat eight along with her maid. She played her part in rowing the boat until her hands were blistered. She continued travelling after the Titanic disaster until her death on the 27th of June 1927, aged 74 in New York. She was buried with her parents in Erieville Cemetery. The Yusuf family were Syrian Lebanese. Two survivors in this family would have been included in the shortest living survivors list, but seeing as they were from the same family and died close together, I decided to include all three family members here. The family consisted of Katrine, Nabia, and Shafiq. Katrine, mother to Nabia and Shafiq, emigrated to the United States in the early 1900s. She married Beatrice Yusuf in 1904, where Shafiq was born in 1907, and Nabia was born in 1909. Catherine took her children to visit family in Lebanon in 1910 and was returning home to Detroit, Michigan when they embarked upon the Titanic at Cherbourg as steerage passengers. Catherine was asleep at the time of the collision but felt the impact and got the children up and dressed. She carried Nabia while instructing Shafiq to hold on tight to her skirts. Shafiq was separated from his mother in the crowd but thankfully all three managed to survive the sinking and reunited on the Carpathia. They were hospitalised in New York before they returned home to Detroit. On the 22nd of March 1914, Nabia, who was four years old, was left home alone in her crib, while the rest of her family went to church. The family lived above a grocer who heard screaming coming from the apartment. When he went to investigate, the apartment was on fire. He rescued Nabia from the flames, though her clothes were already on fire. She would die of her injuries in hospital, and she was buried in a pauper's grave in Mount Olivet Cemetery. Catherine and Beatrice had another daughter, Sadie in 1915. However, just months later, Catherine would pass away from tuberculosis on 19th of June 1915, aged 26. She was also buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery. Sadie would follow her mother in November. As for Shafiq, he attended the St. Peter and Paul School and was nicknamed Ty because of his survival of the Titanic. His father died in 1926 when he was 19, where he moved in with his aunt and uncle and became a driver for the Ginger Ale Company. He married Catherine and Ruana in 1937 and had four children, the youngest of whom passed away in 2013. Shafiq was described as a quiet individual and never spoke publicly about his experience on the Titanic, though he shared some stories with his family. He retired from trucking in 1967 and passed away on the 18th of May 1991, aged 84. He was buried in Resurrection Cemetery. His headstone marks him as a miracle child who survived the Titanic. William Ewart Corn was a grill cook born in Nottingham in 1884. He was working for the White Star Line as early as 1911, with his last ship before the Titanic being the Olympic. His brother-in-law, Francis Young, was working as a fireman. He married Emily Mayfield early in 1912, though they would never be able to have children. He would perish in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 27. His death was acknowledged in the Southern Daily Echo on 29th of April. In Old Cemetery, Southampton, the Quant family tombstone honours him with the quote, In the midst of life we are in death. His death was recognised in newspapers both in Southampton where he was living before the disaster and in his native Nottingham, including the Nottingham Evening Post, which is now Nottingham Live. His wife moved back to Nottingham and died in 1948. William Henry Allen was a steerage passenger from Nottingham. By 1901, he was working as an engine fitter's apprentice and married his landlord's daughter, Florence Ann Rigby, in 1906, though she remained in Nottingham with her parents while Allen was working as a toolmaker in Coventry. However, by 1912, they were both living in Birmingham together. Allen intended to emigrate to the United States where his uncle lived in New York City and would likely send for Florence once he was established there. A steward, George Hinckley, was a good friend of his, whom he had previously worked with in Birmingham. Allen, however, would never reach New York, as he perished in the sinking and his body was not recovered. He was 39 years old. In 2000, his suitcase was recovered from the wreck site. His clothes still had his name stamped on them. Mr. Dean! Sir! There's a distress 
call just come through. Who from? The Titanic. They've struck a bird. Yes, a leg post, Master. No, they've struck a bird. They want us to come at once. They're sinking. The Titanic? Don't be a fool. It's true. I'm going to the captain. This is dedicated to someone who was never on the Titanic, but was a key part in rescuing the survivors. Harold Thomas Cotton was born in Southall, Nottinghamshire in 1891, and was the oldest of five sons. After leaving grammar school, he trained with the Marconi wireless system, and graduated from the Great British School of Telegraphy, age 17, the youngest student to do so. As he worked primarily for the Marconi Company, he would serve on both Cunard and White Star Line ships during his career. By April 1912, he had completed two voyages on the RMS Carpathia. On the night of 14th of April, he was preparing to turn in for the night, waiting for a message from the Parisian. To his surprise, he heard the Titanic's distress call and recognised the signature of Jack Phillips, who was friends with Cotton. Cotton defied the officers when they dismissed his claim that the Titanic was sinking and ran to the captain's cabin. Captain Rostron, thankfully, took him seriously and had the ship turn around towards the Titanic's location. Cotton continued to communicate with Phillips until the signal died. When the Carpathia reached the survivors, Cotton worked with the surviving operator Harold Bride to deliver messages from the survivors to their families. When the Carpathia arrived in New York, Cotton was visited by Guglielmo Marconi himself in his hotel. He continued working for the Marconi Company throughout World War I and afterwards. He married Elsie Jean Shepperson in 1924 and had four children. His son Angus predeceased him in the 1960s. He retired to the Nottinghamshire village of Loudham, which is not far from Southall. Harold Cotton would pass away on the 30th of May 1984, aged 93, and he was cremated at Wilford Hill in Nottingham. The reason this piqued my interest is because Wilford Hill is also a cemetery as well as a crematorium, and both my maternal grandparents were buried there. My grandfather died in 1979, so he was already interred there before Harold Cotton died and had his ashes scattered in the Garden of Rest. Cotton received an obituary in the Times newspaper acknowledging his brave, if disobedient, actions in making sure that the Titanic received the aid she needed. Otherwise, the Titanic survivors would have been waiting much longer for rescue. The survivors of the Titanic owed their lives to Cotton, and he was fondly remembered as a friendly and lively person throughout his life. I have never written a script this long before. But my interest in making another one of these videos came when I wondered how many people survived the Titanic only to perish during World War I. How horrible must it be to survive one world-changing event just to die in another? Plus, my mother's own research into the Spanish flu pandemic also made me wonder if any survivors died of the flu. In both cases, I was very surprised to find out that the number was so low and it led me to have a lot of shower thoughts and I realised it was because a lot of the casualties of Titanic were men aged between 18 to 40, which was the prime ages of recruitment for both sides of the war. Had there been more lifeboats, or if Lightoller had actually let more men on the boats, as Murdoch did, then these potential survivors may well have gone on to die in the trenches. Even more surprisingly, only one Titanic survivor actually died serving in World War II, and only one died in the Blitz. Once again, I theorised it was because a lot of men who would have signed up went down with the ship. Plus, 30 years or so after the sinking would mean that a lot of those who did survive may have been too old to enlist. What's more, had America joined both world wars sooner than they did, more male survivors would likely have been killed in action. But to those who did die serving in both world wars, we will remember them. This video and the previous one have helped me understand how history never happens in singular events. History is a massive web that we can't see the full picture of. Each significant moment is connected to an infinite number of other moments, and there are people out there whom you didn't even realise were connected to the Titanic in one way or another. You yourself may have some tiny thread of connection to the Titanic. Anyway, this video is at last finished. I don't know if I'll do another one of these. They do take a lot out of me. It is nearly 6pm on the 10th of April 2024. It has been 112 years since the Titanic has left port. And oh my god, I am so damn tired. <laughs> Sometimes I really underestimate how big a video project's gonna be. Now in the interests of 
research for this video. Most of my sources comes from the website Encyclopedia Titanica, which carries a huge database of the people who are on the Titanic, as well as people related to the Titanic, people who have researched the Titanic, and there's a lot of discussion rooms, and it pretty much has everything you needed to know about the Titanic. But also I have to do a few shout outs to another website and a few YouTube channels who have been very influential in my Titanic journey. Because on top of Encyclopedia Titanica, there has also been the Titanic Wiki, which also has a lot of information on pretty much everything you want to know about the Titanic. So there's Titanic Honor and Glory, which is probably the best known Titanic channel on YouTube because they're working towards creating an entire recreation of the ship as a video game, and it's amazing. And they also do real-time syncing live streams pretty much every year. And then there is Ocean Liner Designs, who analyses components of all types of ocean liners, but there are quite a lot of Titanic videos as well. And there's also Titanic Animations, who, like Titanic Honor and Glory, has real-time syncing videos of not only the Titanic, but also the Lusitania and other vessels. And also Historic Travels, who, like Encyclopedia Titanica, answer every question you may have had about the Titanic, but in a fun way that gives practical demonstrations of how things might have played out. And I can't go without thanking my patrons who support me in everything I do. You can see them here. If you want to sign up, no matter what tier you sign up to, you will always be able to be featured in the credits and you'll be able to discuss stuff with me on the Discord server that I've made. And also higher level contributors, the Duke and Duchess and King and Queen patrons. They've been able to access this video earlier than everyone else. And highest contributors, they get a shout out in the credits. Thank you, Alison Cuff, Anna from Gustine, Annalise Barnett, Jill Minero, Larissa and Leslie Williams. 